good evening one and all first of all my sincere thanks to dr harikishan and the team broncos for uh, inviting this lecture uh, i am from vijayawada working at aish hospitals uh, vijayawada is the capital city of our state and uh, it is famous for its uh, unique structure prakasham barrage uh, that is built on the river krishna and the city has its own identity by having signs of ancient buddhism so whenever you visit uh, come across vijayawada please try to visit uh, coming to the my today's talk uh, raising medical expenses is the big problem and big hurdle for the developing nations not only for the developing nations even in the developed countries uh, patients who doesn't have any medical uh, insurances they have to struggle a lot to get the things to be done so keeping these all financial constraints in mind i and my team used to work uh, since many years uh, how to cut down this uh, uh, procedural related cost and all uh, so we modified some uh, techniques uh, in the ip field and we brought uh, some of these techniques uh, so i am very thankful to my friends and my technicians and my mentors because who shared their ideas to develop all these uh, modifications uh, so for next few minutes i am going to demonstrate these procedures i am i am sure that i am not going to bother you much with the literature and all these all are like procedural videos the first one is uh, stent in scope so what is this stent in scope do we really need a stent applicator to load a stent uh, the concept behind this uh, stent in scope came into my mind uh is like when if you want to remove the de uh, deployed silicon stent from the airway what you usually will do will put a rigid bronchoscope then will go inside will catch the stent with the grasper and then will, what we'll do will rotate the stent with 360 degrees and pull the stent into the bro bronchoscope so that is how we'll do the stent removal so we can able to remove the stent without any applicator then why can't we place the stent with applicator so this strike in my mind then we started loading the stents in the bronchoscope you believe me or not since 5 years we are not using any stent applicators for uh, deploying silicon stents and i am going to show you how the stents will be loaded in the rigid bronchoscopes so what for uh, stent loading what we need is like one tracheal scope and one bronchial scope and a stent grasper forceps and the lubricant spray these are the things we need just to the uh, load the stent so here uh, what i am holding is the tracheal scope and uh, i need one bronchial scope to load the stent because uh, the will intubate with the tracheal scope and then later will load the stent in the bronchial scope and will deploy the stent if you look at the steps here uh, i am loading the stent now into the bronchoscope so the stent was already there so now i am catching the stent with the grasper you can see my assistant is helping to load the stent into the bronchoscope here so what we are doing just we are approximating the stent into the rigid bronchoscope later same like stent removal you have to rotate the stent into 360 degrees the stent will rotate and that time you have to pull the stent into the scope so now you can see the stent is nicely going into the rigid bronchoscope so only thing just you need to rotate and pull it inside see this is the 18 mm stent nicely went inside the bronchoscope so now the stent is ready the scope is ready for deployment so this is how the loaded stent in the bronchoscope looks like then how to deploy the stent you need to intubate with the tracheoscope then you can remove the uh the proximal detachable head later introduce your uh, loaded uh, rigid bronchoscope into the tracheoscope and uh, keep uh, keep the scope in the position and deploy the stent so here you can see the i am deploying the stent in the stenotic segment this is for just demonstration purpose uh, i made this video so you can see the stent will go into the stenotic segment and here you can see the live case here how we did so here we are uh, the loaded stent was deploying under vision with the forceps so i am pushing the stent into the 
trachea here. The stent is going very nicely into the trachea. And under vision, I am deploying the stent, which is not possible with your stent applicator. And this is how it looks like after deployment. Then coming to the coaxial balloon. What is this coaxial balloon? Uh, is nothing but like uh, we, this uh, technique uh, is like simple, very, very simple. Any balloon of any size can fit to any size of the scope. That is the concept behind this coaxial balloon. So most of the times what we'll do, we'll use the single-use balloon at one time through the working channel. Suppose if you are having a small scope, you want to do dilatation with a big balloon, which is not possible at all. Or if you want to reuse the balloon, uh, suppose due to fin financial constraints, what you can do? You can use this technique. Just use your biopsy forceps, pass through the working channel, and then catch the tip of the balloon with your biopsy forceps and bring it close to the bronchoscope and make the balloon parallel to your scope. Now this is ready to go inside. So see the balloon is parallel to the scope. The tip was catched with the biopsy forceps. And you can see how I am deploying the, uh, how I am using the balloon in the trachea. So the balloon is uh, caught with the biopsy forceps. I'm going inside. They're passing through the larynx. And this is that stenotic site. So I can uh, place the balloon wherever I want. It's not, in, not even in the trachea. If you want to go to the little bit distal, like uh, segmental or subsegmental bronchus, you can safely you can go, and you can lodge your balloon at your target site, and you can start dilating. So the balloon was placed in the stenotic segment here and started dilating. This is coaxial balloon. And can you imagine a double channel bronchoscope in the near future? Hope so, it may not be possible for I think few more years. And uh, so simply adding this uh, irrigator cap, what is, is actually uh, adapted from the gastro basket. So by connecting this cap, so we have advantage of uh, converting your bronchoscope into a double lumen scope. So you can pass your biopsy forceps into the working channel. With the another port of this irrigation cap, you can use it for irrigation purpose. So you can clear your working channel, and you can clear your all like blood clots or debris uh, by using this irrigation cap. So you can see here, I am doing a biopsy for a bleeding uh, tumor. So I'm passing the uh, biopsy forceps through the working channel, and my assistant uh, is uh, giving flush through the another port. So this can give a clear image. Now, suppose if your scope got blurred with the blood stains, so you can clear with the uh, irrig with irrigation, and the scope get cleared, and your biopsy will be more easy. The, ca the this cap cost not more than two thousands, I think. I can, you can see here the biopsy forceps is inside the uh, airway, and uh, if you want, you can flush with the another port. Because of bleeding, I cannot able to visualize. So what we did, just we gave a given flush, even the biopsy forceps inside the airway. So we can get a clear uh, picture. Then another modification is like water jet system. This is also adapted from the gastro basket. So this is nothing but a positive a water jet. So because of this positive pressure of the water, so it will open the collapsed airways. So especially this uh, water jet system is very useful uh, when you are having a hidden foreign body in the collab collapsed airways or if you are dealing with a massive hemoptysis case. So this system will work very well. Uh, so this is how the water jet system works. You can see the uh, positive jet coming from the bronchoscope. Again, for this system, you need that irrigation cap. You have to connect uh, the system to the bronchoscope by using this irrigation cap. So the scope is connected to the water jet system by using this irrigation cap. And uh, this is the water jet system. What you can see is the motor is running. This motor will create the positive jet. 
So because of that positive pressure, the airway will be opened very nicely. And uh, you can take ball, you can uh, do like a therapeutic bronchial toilet with this uh, water jet system. And uh, if you want to identify a hidden foreign body, that also you can do with this water jet system. So here I am taking the ball. So this uh, system will have a foot operating uh, switch. So you can control your uh, fluid in, uh, the filling into the airway. So how much fluid has to go, that can be decided by you only. So here just simply I'm taking the ball. And uh, this is a case of foreign impacted foreign body in the left lower lobe bronchus. Uh, so the foreign body is not visualized properly here. So what, because it is covered by granulation, so we did a uh, electrocautery cut and we opened the bronchus. But still because of the collapsed airway, we cannot identify the foreign body. So what I did here, just I used the water jet system. So I just, I opened the bronchus, I went inside, still the foreign body is not visible. So, but once you start using this water jet, because of that positive pressure, you can see the foreign body nicely. So that positive pressure can open the collapsed bronchus and it will give proper vision. And at the same time, you can control the bleeding and uh, you can clear the debris around the, your bronchoscope. So that can provide a clarity picture. So now we just we catch the foreign body and we are remo retrieving. So that is the advantage of water jet system. Then coming to the cost effective hemlick wall. The average cost of hemlick wall in our country is around, uh, around five to six thousand. Uh, so this can be replaced by just simply placing a balloon between your ICD intercostal tube and bag. So that can convert uh, your intercostal drain into the hemlick wall. How we can do it that I can go, going to demonstrate now. This is how the system looks like. So what you are seeing the proximal portion is the intercostal tube and the distal one is the drain system. So just I place the balloon between this uh, tube and drain. So this balloon act as a one-way wall and it will not allow the backflow of fluid from drainage bag into the pleural cavity. That, can, that is why it can reduce the contamination of the pleural cavity. You can see here this patient came with a uh, spontaneous pneumothorax with minimal air leak. Actually somebody placed ICD outside because lung is not expanding. They referred the patient to us. Uh, so we did the thoracoscopy because to look the what is there inside. So this is the additions, like you can see this, uh, the, the amount of pleural contamination here. Everything is because of just the backflow of fluid from the, your ICD bag. So this can be prevented by uh, using this balloon. If suppose if you are having a hemlick wall, that's fine. If suppose if your patient is not affordable, the hemlick wall, you can use simply a balloon. So what you have to do, just take the balloon, sterilize it with uh, either your Cydex or uh, uh, 2% chlorhexidine or uh, you can use ETO uh, balloons and just cut the balloon at the proximal end and fix the balloon between the intercostal tube and drain. So I'm fixing the uh, balloon to the intercostal tube now. So you can see the balloon is fixed to the intercostal tube. Now what we'll do then we have to introduce the balloon into the drainage bag. So the balloon is going into the drainage bag now. So this makes uh, your drain is ready with a safety wall. And you can see here, the backflow is prevented by your balloon. Then coming to the surgical drain, is a solution for uh, uh, indwelling pleural catheter. The efficacy and safety of inwelling pleural catheter was well established, no doubt about it. Uh, but uh, if you look at like pros and cons of every procedure, uh, so every procedure will have their its own disadvantages. Like IPC is also having some complications like uh, IPC related pleural infections, catheter tract metastasis, symptomatic loculations, fracture of catheter soil removal, blockage, chest pain and all. The most important thing is the cost of IPC. So we only concentrated about the cost because the complications will be there for every procedure, but our worry is to bother about the cost. Because in our country, it costs around nearly 30 to 40,000. So
So most of my patients are not affordable of, of the cost of IPC. So what we did, just we replaced the IPC with the simple surgical drain, which is available at very cheaper cost. Uh, if you look at the differences between the conventional IPC and the surgical drain, the conventional IPC is usually made up of silicon catheter, and it has its own safety features like one-way valve and as well as the polyester cuff in between the silicon catheter. But the same, uh, if you look at the surgical drain, it is made up of PVC material, but it can be tunneled very easily, and with few modifications, we can provide the safety mechanisms with this drain also. That, uh, that I am going to show now, how you can increase the, or you can enhance the safety mechanisms of the surgical drain. This drain is also available in kit. Uh, this kit will contain a vacuum container and two sets of uh, your drains, and uh, the trocar is, will be there, and the connector system. So in this system, only we need is that trocar with drain and the connector. The remaining things usually we don't need for our procedure. So, in our trial, we choose the 14 and 16 Frenches. So, we, in the market, we have nearly from 6 French to 16 French, uh, there are different sizes of catheters are available. But our, but our procedure, we choose 14 and 16 because we can connect these catheters to the three-way uh, cannulas and uh, ICD bags very easily. That is the reason we choose this 14 and 16 French. And uh, we inserted this catheter uh, in approximately more than 50 patients. And uh, we followed the uh, like uh, pre-procedure uh, protocol for every patient. The pre-procedure chest X-ray and CT we did for everyone. And uh, ultrasound before doing the procedure to localize the effusion and to measure the quantity of fluid and to look for the uh, additions. Uh, so that is mandatory. And uh, with the help of ultrasound, we'll make the port of entry usually on the posterior axillary line and uh, port of exit, that what we call the character will come out through the chest wall, that is on the anterior axillary line. Usually for conventional IPC, four to five centimeters of tunneling is enough. Since we don't have the polyester cuff for this drain, so we use a little bit more tunneling, that is nearly seven to eight centimeters. So we did tunneling uh, with, uh, seven to eight centimeters to prevent infection as well as uh, di uh, displacement. And uh, with all sterile uh, aseptic precautions, under lignocaine local anesthesia, uh, we did all the procedures, and, and antibiotic prophylaxis was done for every patient, and simple analgesia uh, is needed for procedure. Now, these are the things we need for uh, in insertion of the surgical drain. The kit I already demonstrated, and uh, this is the drain, how it looks like, which will go into the pleural cavity, and this is the three-way cannula with extension to provide the safety mechanisms so that can prevent uh, entry of air and backflow of fluid into the pleural cavity. So that can reduce the contamination of pleural cavity. And uh, every patient uh, with under complete sterile precautions under ultrasound guidance will do the procedure. And this is how the procedure looks like, just 0.5 centimeters incision for the entry port and another 0.5 centimeters incision for the exit port. A given uh, entry port incision later, we have to give a blunt dissection to open the intercostal spaces and pleura, then insert the trocar, uh, that uh, drain into the pleural cavity. So once is the sufficient length of drain went inside the pleural cavity, then what you have to do? Then remove the trocar and do a tunneling. So like, depends on well, like, uh, how much amount of length you want, like six or seven centimeters, you can do tunneling very easily with the provided cat, uh, trocar. The trocar is very sharp, you should be a little bit careful when you are doing tunneling. So that's all, your tunneling uh, process is over. Then we'll suture the incision wounds, and uh, this is how it looks like. And nowadays, uh, for all uh, suspected malignancy patients, those who undergo for thoracoscopy, we started using this drain as a extra drain, apart from that regular ICD. So, so once we got the diagnosis, and if it turned out to be malignancy, we can use the drain for future purpose like pleurodesis or drainage of the fluid. Suppose it's turned out to be non-malignant, just we'll simply pull out the tube. So that is not going to cost much. Instead of using uh, conventional IPC and spending more money, simply we are using, we replace this drain uh, with uh, conventional IPC. And this is how we'll aspirate the fluid. It's like your simple thoracensis. You can use the three-way extension cannula and try, you can try to aspirate uh, the fluid based on the amount of accumulation, probably once in a week or twice a week. Or if patient A can able to manage at home, we'll give a proper training so they can go home and they can uh, tap there at home with their uh, taking their family members' help. Or 
If you want, you can connect this drain to your drainage bag by using this connector. So this is also provided with the kit. So just you can take this uh, tip, and you, one end will go into the intercostal bag, and the another tip, uh, that uh, narrow tip, will connect to the drain. So the fluid will drain into the bag. So this is how we'll connect the connector to the that uh, plural catheter to the ICD bag. Or if you want uh, use the three-way cannula, just remove this one and fix the three-way cannula. See, uh, the three-way cannula is fixing now here. And the wound looks like this after the procedure. Usually we'll uh, close the wound and we'll wrap the catheter in the sterile gauze piece and we'll pack it. And the patient will go home on the same day. And because since it is a radio opaque substance, you can uh, visualize the catheter in the X-rays. And uh, every, case, every patient may need not go the catheter in the same place. This is a different case. This is a case of post hemorrhectomy air leak. So this patient underwent so many procedures to block the leak. Uh, finally, he landed to us. Uh, so we did just we used the pleural catheter to drain the fluid. So we placed the pleural catheter in the second space because we don't have space in the uh, lateral wall because that uh, rib massive rib crowding. Um, so we don't have space. Just we place the uh, catheter in the second space and we send the patient with. Uh, back. And finally, we compared our uh, drain with our con uh, experience with uh, conventional IPZ, and we took the uh, large retrospective trial of uh, BMC publication. The results are on par with all the studies, so, uh, and it was proven. And finally, we presented this data in the uh, WABIP 2022 Marche. The conclusion, the closed wound small bore surgical drain is economical, effective, and well tolerated. It can be used in lieu of IPC in low cost settings. So now I'm going to end my talk with my favorite slide. So in India, everybody's dream is bench, but uh, I know how many of us can afford a bench, but still uh, nobody stopped their journey. Still our own manufacturer, Maruti, is running successfully in our country. Thank you. If you are having any doubts, catch me on my mail or phone number. Thank you, Hari, for giving this opportunity. And thanks to my teachers, friends, and my team. Thank you very much.